Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leon Hartwell. Welcome to our 29th LSE Ideas Russia Ukraine Dialogue. We're part funded by Peace Rep, an international research project led by the University of Edinburgh Law School, which delivers research and tracks data on conflict and its resolution. Today, we'll focus on support for the war among Russians, and I hope that we'll get to cover a variety of issues, including the impact of sanctions on Russian thinking generational perspectives on the war, the impact of battlefield dynamics and mobilization on support for the war, and the future of Russia-Ukraine relations. To discuss these issues, I'd like to welcome four panelists. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Alina Popova, Russian opposition politician, founder of the Ethics and Technology Think Tank, and currently also a public fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. Secondly, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ian Gardner, scholar of Russian culture and war propaganda. His forthcoming book, uh, Z Generation Into the Heart of Russia's Fascist Youth, will be published by Oxford University Press. Thirdly, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jade McGlynn, a Leverholm researcher in war studies at the War Studies Department at King's College. Uh, she published two books this year, uh, Russia's War and Memory Makers. And then last but not least, I'd like to welcome Maxim Kruglov, MP in the Moscow City Duma, chairman of the Yabloka faction of the Moscow City Duma and deputy chair of the Moscow branch of the Yabloko party, the social liberal political party in Russia. And before we start, especially given that we have two Russian panelists, I'd like to remind our audience of a few matters. Shortly after the full-scale military invasion of Ukraine, five children between the ages of five and 11 were detained in Moscow after they laid flowers in front of the Ukrainian embassy. And not long thereafter, a series of laws were rushed through the Russian parliament, establishing the war censorship and prohibiting anti-war statements and calls for sanctions. In April, 2022, a live stream on YouTube uh, by Ilya Yashin, one of Putin's key critics, urged investigation into possible war crimes committed by Russian forces and called Putin the worst voter in this war. As a direct result of that live stream, Yashin was sentenced to eight and a half years in jail for violating a law against spreading deliberate false information about the Russian army. More recently, uh, St. Petersburg archaeologist uh, Oleg Volosov was sentenced to five and a half years in prison for anti-war comments that he made on social media. In short, for any Russian, young or old, to speak out against this war is no small matter. So to kick us off with this discussion, I am going to turn to Alina Popova. Uh, and uh, Alina, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate it, especially given um, the circumstances that I laid out earlier. Now, in Russia, uh, what are the main risks for those who speak out against the war? What is your position on the Russia-Ukraine war? And how do you think sanctions are impacting on how Russians feel about this war? Over to you, Alina. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me here. Uh, so you you did my job. You gave some examples. You gave the, you already gave some examples. I wanted to give, but I will illustrate my answer with some more examples about the risks that we all have. By the way, I was labeled as a foreign agent by our Ministry of Justice. And for me, it means that I can be um, imprisoned um, just for, um, I don't know, just for disclose some information about this war and disagreement with our official authorities or our current regime. As uh, my position is labeled as a national traitor. So I am a national traitor uh, for uh, many Russians in our country. But uh, what about risks? So um, Masha, uh, 12 years old uh, school students drew a picture at school against the war. Uh, the director of her school called the police. Masha's dad was arrested and Masha was taken to an orphanage. So many independent media started the campaign just to um, 
to help Masha uh, not to be an orphanage and to do something with that. But it was like, um, it's insane. It's awful. This is about the risks. So our current uh, regime um, use its power to suppress not, not just uh, the people who are 18 plus, but also your kids, your relatives, and doesn't matter their position. It doesn't matter what position do they have. Our current or our official authorities, they just use their power to suppress your independent or uh, like bright, bright minded thinking. So another example, spouses Alexander uh, Martinov and Lyudmila Razumova were sentenced to seven and six and a half years in prison for their social media post against the war and against the murders uh, of the Ukrainian people in Mariupol and Kherson. In my headquarter, I ran for office in 2021, by the way, from the Yabloka party, and Maxim was my huge supporter over there. Uh, in my headquarter, I had two bright activists, Arshak and Sasha Popova. So Arshak has his um, anti -war, very vocal anti-war position, and our system revoked his citizenship due to his anti-war position. Just listen to me, revoked his citizenship. And um, Sasha Popova, uh, she has a husband who was raped by a policeman just because he was arrested due to his anti-war poems. Uh, and he was very vocal again, the war too. And I give you, to compare what's going on, I give you one more example. Forbidden in the family, uh, like the domestic violence offenses, you will face a fine up to 5,000 rubles. It's like less than $100. Uh, but for the post on social media network against the war, you can be sentenced up to six years in a penal colony. Also another example, uh, the ex-deputy of the city of Tatarsk, it's, uh, it's my home region, the Novosibirsk region. So he knocked down uh, a six-year-old boy in a car and left. Uh, for this, this ex-deputy was sentenced to only 10 months of corrective labor. But Masha's father, Masha's Moskalova's father, Alexei, he received two years in prison just for his anti-war post on social media. And this is my answer about our total risks that we all have in Russia. And I would like to highlight that it doesn't matter um, what your relative thinks, uh, uh, think about that war and how they behave if you are uh, very vocal against this war. If you have your vocal position, your relatives can suppress, your kids can be suppressed uh, by our uh, official regime. And also if they use this total surveillance machine, um, they, they can find out what is your geolocation, um, with, with whom you can meet uh, in, in Russia. Um, they can blackmail you. They can do everything they want because we have dictatorship. When someone asked me, what do you think um, about Russians and why I am not protesting on streets? I would like to answer, do we have an example in the world in which uh, people defeat the dictatorship just being protesting on streets? So we have, China authorities who are in power, we have Iranian authorities who are in power, but despite of 2000 protests in China taking place each year, also we have, you know, um, our neighbor countries, for example, Belarus, in which there were like huge mass protests and we strongly supported them, but still Lukashenko is in power. Um, so the question, what is my position about this war? So I have my red Russian passport. I don't have my second citizenship. I don't want to burn my Russian passport or to, I don't know, cut it or to get rid of it. I don't want to seek for political asylum just because I'm very vocal against the war. I think that we need to take our responsibility as citizens for this war. Um, and we need, I, I think that this is our historical chance to do something. Um, but my position is that Russians and Russia as a different creature, as a different creatures, as a different things. So you can't combine, you can't just mix up, mix us. 
So maybe we are in minority, but we need to fight back and we can do that. And we need that support because if you think that, okay, you are the minority, you're useless, you don't have any power to do anything. So you make us useless and you strengthen our regime. And this is my position against the world. So we need to be very vocal. We need to be united. We need to have as much support as we have and we can do something I'm sure that we can. Thank you for that message also um, and the reminder of course that that this uh your position people with the same position uh you know that carries uh, real dangers for for both you and and possibly even family members back in russia um let's go to uh jade um jade your title of your new book is uh, russia's war uh, implying that this is not just Putin's war, um, but that this is something that is wide, widely supported in Russia. How did you get to that conclusion? Over mm -hmm. to you, Jay. Thank you, Leon. I mean, I would just say that I don't conclude that it does have widespread support in Russia. I don't think support is the right word, at least in English, um, because that implies that people are very enthusiastic about this full-scale war and um, but that's just certainly not not the case. So um, just as um, Aliona there gave a very sort of moving summary of of, um, of the risks that that um, are incredible um, to those who are this, what we might call the active opposition, but that the active opposition, of course, are, are not representative, let's say, of of, of a large of, of a majority section of the population. So similarly, I would say, or perhaps even less representative, are the active supporters, you know, those ones who are people who are really, um, really, really enthusiastic about the war. I think really most people in, in my, from my research and from my analysis and fieldwork since sort of 2014, but also as well since 2022, really people fit much more into a group, into one of three groups, which is, and this is really how the, the Kremlin, like the government likes it, because people in these three groups are much easier to manage, but essentially you have those who are apathetic. Um, so perhaps they don't like the war, but there's nothing, they they feel like there's nothing they can do about it. And of course, some of the awful treatment meted out to the Russian opposition um, reinforces that sense of apathy and that sense of pointlessness. And then you, the Kremlin will try to, or the propagandists will try to nudge that group into, well, my country right or wrong, where people think, well, I'm not going to, I don't know, who knows what's true, but what I do know is that people are attacking Russia and, you know, there's this besieged fortress mentality. And so, well, I've only got one country, so I'm going to stick with that. And, and this is the patriotic move. And then that group, uh, the propaganda sort of works on some of those to, to nudge them into the what we might call ritual supporters category. So people who do support the war, but essentially in a plebiscitary way because the government's doing it, because they because they like Putin and because it's easier or because it resonates, because that's the important thing about propaganda. It doesn't change minds. It reinforces certain opinions, making them more and more extreme over time. And that's definitely what we've seen um, in the case of propaganda around Ukraine since 2014. So my argument, yes, of course, is that it isn't just Putin's war. Um, it's far too simplistic to blame a war that's been going on since 2014. Um, on one person, and it will make for terrible policy decisions. Clearly, he's a very important, the most important catalyst um, of, of the war, but it's Putin's war and it's Russia's war. Um, and if, and on, by the same sort of token, it's, of course, also incredibly simplistic, not, you know, even leaving aside more of the incredible moral qualms and bigotry of saying this, but to say that all Russians are guilty. Um, or that there's something wrong with with Russians, you know, there's something inherent. It's it's both views are, are nonsense. I think it's productive. That said, I think it's productive from a policy point of view to look at why Russians, why so many Russians appear to approve of the war, because it tells us a lot about authoritarian societies. It tells us a lot about how best to target our policymaking, what hasn't worked, what won't work. Um, I mean, here in 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 the West and. You know, I suppose just to, to finish on, on that final point, I do think that the word support is really not the right word for, for most for, for what we are seeing in Russia. I think what we are seeing is an acquiescence. I think it's something more more passive than a support of the war. And thanks, Jade, for uh, lending a lot of nuance also to to that uh, debate and and for um, you know just laying it out in those those different categories. Um, let's turn now to Ian, because because you recently you're you're about to publish a, a book on on 
a similar issue um, and, and you can really also lend some uh, uh, sort of nuance also in terms of how different generations look at, at this war. Um, your book, A Generation, of course, focuses on, on Russia's youth specifically, and, and in it you describe a, a fascist generation that is more zealous, violent, and ideological than anything that Russia has seen before. Now, with regards to the Russia-Ukraine war, what are the major differences of perspective among millennials and Gen Zs compared to older generations? Thank you, Ian. So firstly, I would thank you, Eliana, for your comments. They were as wonderful as the wrong word for it, but, but deeply moving. So thank you for being here. It's, it's brave that you're here and thank you for speaking out and, and doing what you're doing. And I would also echo what Jay said that, you know, support is, is a difficult word to use when we're talking about this issue. And clearly we are not talking about a majority of Russians being those sort of headbanging extreme right-wing propagandists like Vladimir Tatarsky, the guy that was killed at the weekend, you know, this, this is a small group of Russians, but they're very good at drawing attention to themselves. But my thoughts about Russia's youth, and my book is about the changing of generations and a project that the government would like to project onto young Russians. Whether it can is, of course, always subject to the same caveat that anything to do with the Russian state is, and now that it is that the state is often deeply incompetent and corrupt. It picks up ideas, it drops them, it struggles to carry things out. And so the book describes things as they are, but also imagines what could happen if the state is as successful as it would like to be. And, and what the state would like to do is to create increasing division between an in-group and an out-group. Us, that is the Russian, the orthodox, the masculine, the macho, the violent, and the them. Anybody on the outside, this amorphous but synonymous group of enemies that is the collective West, that is Ukrainians, that is ethnic minorities, that is in particular, and this is a subject I'm very interested in in the book, members of the queer community, right? And that's why you can get these absurd claims in Russian propaganda that the enemies of Russia are transgender Jewish satanic Nazis, right? which are which are things that just can't go together. It's completely illogical. All of these things are non-Russian. And what we find when we look at the changing of generations is that millennials, broadly speaking, grew up before a shift towards a much more ideological form of education in Russia. They have memories of the 2000s when there was a plurality of identities permitted. You could be a queer Russian. Now, not to say that being a queer Russian was easy in the 2000s, right? Russia has always been behind Western Europe and America in that regard, but it was, it was possible to identify as a patriot and as a homosexual or somebody who is even potentially transgender. But increasingly we're seeing that's, that's harder and harder to do. But the government is trying to strip out from children the ability to follow different identity pathways. And so when I talk about Z generation, I'm not talking about Generation Z, because I think the oldest members of our Generation Z are old enough to remember the, the late 2000s, the early 2010s, a different period before, in particular, Crimea, which wrecked a lot of Russia's, Russians opportunities to go abroad, to study abroad, to aspire to a different kind of political life and political existence. I'm thinking of the children who are growing up being pulled into groups like the Youth Army, which is the paramilitary youth group, these kids with the, the red tops on the berets, very distinctive, who are being increasingly publicized. The membership of that group is growing rapidly and the state is pushing money at it. And what the state is doing is, what Jade said the propaganda doesn't change minds. Well, in essence, you're right. But what the state understands is that in particular in the social media world in which we live nowadays, propaganda can create realities. And we can all live in different realities. And it is very easy to create an outgroup of Masha Maskalyovas, young girls who are villainous traitors to the country, 
and show those up as examples of do not be the non-Russian. And on the other hand, create a social media reality in which your, your peers appear to all belong to the youth army. They appear to be following the state's propaganda. They appear to be joining in the right groups and saying the right things. And it makes following the state's dictates suddenly a lot more appealing. What do the children and teens want more than anything else? They want to belong. And thanks to social media, and this is the last point I'll make, thanks to social media, the government is able to strip out the problem that it has of parents and families who traditionally get in the way of authoritarian projects at reshaping minds. Because the government can interact directly with children. Nobody can close the door of the apartment and get rid of the government anymore. There is no sitting at kitchen tables and quietly discussing anti-authoritarian ideas. Because guess what? As soon as you load up your phone, you're bombarded with messages from the state, messages that appear to come from your peers, messages that appear to make support for war, for violence, for masculine aggression desirable. Thank you, Ian. And, and again, for that nuance that you added there and, and talking about um, these in and out groups that are so uh, important to try and understand this, this, this type of concept from the outside is hard because we have um, uh, fewer and fewer information filtering through uh, from from Russia in terms of our Western understanding from the outside. Um, so we're going to turn to Maxim also on that note. And Maxim, thank you also for joining us, um, especially in the context of the risks involved in talking about this issue um, being Russian. Um, I'd like to ask you about your perspective um, for, uh, you know, of when it comes to support or whatever word you want to use, Jade also said we have to be very careful about this word support for the war among Russians. But how, how do you see it? Um, what, what is your party's position on the matter? And importantly, I'd, I'd really like to understand also how you think battlefield dynamics and mobilization impacts on Russian sentiments towards the war. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, yes, uh, Leon, thank you very much for the question and for invitation me to speak here. It is my pleasure to be here. And first of all, I want to say that me personally and uh, my party, Yabloka, we are against this military actions against the Ukraine. We consider this as a huge tragedy and we think that there are no justifications and no excuses for it. Uh, this is our principal uh, statement. Uh, then I have to say that, of course, the support of military actions against the Ukraine in Russian society is extremely high. We can see it even without any sociological pulls. I assume that there are some uh, specific reasons uh, of this support. First uh, uh, is rather total propaganda from Kremlin. So. Uh, day and nights from the TV, we can hear about the Ukrainian Nazis and about some plans of Western countries and NATO to divide Russia on some pieces. And uh, people believe uh, on this stuff. And it is important to understand that all independent media in Russia are destroyed and all the alternative sources of information are prohibited. So the propaganda is really total. And this is the one reason. Uh, there are some social and psychological reasons uh, for this support, which based on some historical traumas, uh, such as I think that fall apart of the country in the be beginning of 90s, the feeling of humiliation and defeat, and the fact is that Russia was not included in European and Western political and economical space during uh, 90s. I consider that uh, there is some fault on Western countries also about this because the political leaders made some profit business uh, with Putin about oil, about gas, and 
there were no liberal values in in it in this process and nobody from them and none of them thought about any long-term plan about integration russia into european space uh, so they didn't need it and um uh, i have to say that according to this there is a huge amount of people who don't stand for the military action against the ukraine who don't support this even according to official russian sociological polls uh about 20 percent of russians are against all of this and i think that this is um, a very huge amount of people this is about 20 millions of people of russian people and we have to understand and alona uh, spoke about all these cases uh of the price of the protests uh, against the war in russia there is censorship uh, no freedom of speech uh some special laws or criminal laws uh, for anti-war position and i will not repeat this but uh even this, uh, there is a huge amount of uh, people who are against uh, all of this. And, um, but of course, uh, many Russians stand for these military actions, unfortunately. But I assume that Russian society is not unique in this. I think that all of the societies in those countries which has been started wars some military actions they are on common and the same way uh, and the majority of people always and anywhere support these wars support the actions of their authorities and uh, it doesn't matter if it is in liberal democracy or in authoritarian country. For example, we can remember the United States and the war in Iraq and uh, the uh, reaction of American society. I want to remind that George Bush, Bush was reelected after that war. So I think this is uh, the common case and the reaction of the society are also is also common. So that's why I, I consider that Russians also as a victim of all of this, as a hostage of propaganda and universal and common mechanism to every society during this war. Thank you. Um, thank you, Maxim, for that insight also. Um, I'm going to um, turn back to Alina also um, to perhaps uh, a comment also about, uh, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to read uh, Jade and, and Ian's books, but I'm, I'm sure you, you're quite familiar with their arguments at this point. But I, I'd like to hear your perspective on how they characterize uh, Russian attitudes uh, during this particular period, Alina. Yes, thanks a lot for that great question. Um, we have a lot of discussions in our society. Uh, do we have this collective guilt? Um, is this war is our war? Uh, how can we influence or we need to take our, we can be self-responsible for what's going on, especially um, if I'm talking about the, the violence, uh, which is insane, it's, it's awful. Um, but I need to point out that our uh, current regime is a rapist and it acts, acts like a rapist outside and inside, uh, outside our country and inside our country, within our country. Uh, we were fighting for the law against domestic violence for more than nine years because domestic violence is an indicator, it was an indicator and it is an indicator of what's going on um, within our society. Violence is like a brick in this uh, fundamental construction of our, our current regime. And uh, when you ask me, can we confuse um, Russians and Russia? No, we can't because Russian society is not a, a monolith. So we have a lot of stratas and then different stratas, uh, people think differently. For example, young generation, and thanks Yan for that comment, young generation is very bright. Um, they, they have their different ideas. They don't want to, to be, correlated with all this crazy violence that we have and we had uh, in Ukraine. 
or uh, um, at least in our society. Um, my main idea that yes, it's Russia's war, but in terms of um, our battle, our struggle with our own regime. So the case is, um, you know, that uh, repentance, repentance um, within our ideology or according to our ideology, Russian ideology um, is like weakness. So if you say, I'm sorry, so our society, Russian society may react like, why are you so sorry? Are you so weak to be sorry? You can't be very weak because we are strong, we are in power, we are superpower. And if you are a politician, for example, I wanted to be a politician, I want to be a politician. I'm still thinking that we need to be involved in politics, not just be the witnesses of what's going on from outside or inside our country. So if you are a politician and you announce that I'm against the war, look, I, I feel sorry. I, I want to take my self-responsibility for what's going on. Many people reaction um, will be like, Alona, you're so weak. You're so weak. We can't support you because you need to fight. You need to be a fighter. So you don't need to be, uh, you don't need to say sorry. And this is like the main idea that I think we need to, to change in our mindset. I mean, in my mindset and mindset of my um, generation and maybe in the mindset of generation of our parents. So my parents are against the war. But for example, many people, 65 plus, they are for the war. Um, but yeah, we, we can't argue that no Russians support this war. Uh, many do. But my main point is that majority isn't everybody. So this is a case. So if we have some people in minority, like we are there, so we need just to focus on that minority, to support that minority to be uh, like the real power. And, and, and the main case is to change the way of thinking, the way how we, um, how we build our future. For example, if we are talking about Nelson Mandela, so the main idea was as, you know, um, the main idea was the truth and reconciliation. And um, it means that first we need to be vocal about the truth and to let us people to know that that our people like, yes, this is the, this is what's going on over there. Just please listen to me. And then why we need to use this uh, repentance? Because in our own families uh, from the Stalin's regime uh, time, uh, we have some people who were responsible for the repressions in our families and also, among our relatives, we have some people who were shooted due to that repressions in one family. And we never, never heal the trauma because we hide this trauma and we never use this, you know, narrative that yes, we are responsible for our past and not to let our past to be our future. We need to talk about that. We need to heal our traumas. We need not to be so violent against each other. So the main idea, we don't want to be violent against each other within our own society. And I think that this was just a mirror of uh, what is going on or what was going on for 23 years in Russian society, because this president, he wasn't elected by me. I never voted for him. This president is a real rapist. And his ideology is that, yes, I am uh, a perpetrator. I am a tyrant. I am a dictator, but um, I am acting for your future. I try to protect you. I try to be very like clever Tsar um, uh, for the whole country. So to change this narrative, we need to divide Russia, Russians, Russians who are very supportive to that war and Russians who are against that war. So that, you know, there's all the different categories. Um, but I think that we can be very influential now. Maybe I, I am like sounded like sounding like a crazy person, insane person, very positive person because we are talking about the war. Um, but I want to be a realist and I want to point out that yes, we can do that. I, I, I did it during my election um, because I, I, you know, two opponents in my own electoral district, they were for uh, the reunion of Soviet Union. Um, in, in 2021. And I thought, yeah, they are crazy. They were crazy. What they were talking about. Come on, what is all about? Soviet Union is crushed. We don't need Soviet Union anymore. So both of them, two men, 
uh, to old men. They are in our state Duma now, and one of them are the main face of the war. Not in the main, but one of the main face of this war. Sergei Obuchov, or the, the, he is a part of the Communist Party, or the member of the Communist Party. Uh, but I saw that many people from all over country, so I was a candidate from Moscow, I ran for office from Moscow, I was a candidate from Yabloka Party in my small, small electoral district in Moscow, but many people from, from all over country, they just sent me money, they donated this money to me. Why? I asked them why, and they said, yeah, yeah, because we think that we need someone uh, to change something. Uh, and it was in 2021. And when I asked them, so what is something? What is this term about? And they asked violence. We don't need violence. We hate violence. We don't, we don't want to live in a country uh, with official ideology that violence is okay. Violence is our traditional, so-called traditional value. No, it's not about us. And that, that's why I strongly believe in our people well, maybe they are not so vocal now because they, they are oppressed. Maybe they don't want to say, yes, I, I confess that I'm so sorry about what's going on because they don't want to be weak in the eyes of the population that can consider this sorry as a weakness. But I strongly believe that we have this people. And, and, and as I told you, that we can do something like we can campaign, we can unite it, we can... Um, ask for some support to be more vocal and to change everything but within our own country, not from outside, but within our own country. Because I think that the core problem is that we need to do something inside Russia, not from outside. Thank you, Alina. I, and I do hope there will be some form of transitional justice, uh, both inside and, and perhaps uh, in the broader region um, uh, when the timing is right. Um, let's Turn again to Jade. Uh, Jade, I know there's a question also from one of our audience members, uh, Amrith uh, Upuluri, um, who asked, uh, oh, sorry, I'm wrong, uh, from Natasha Locke. Uh, I, I, I think I also missed the third group. You mentioned apathetic and then the ritual group. What was the third group? If you can just mention that. Neutral loyals. I'm okay, thank you. And, and then, uh, my other question to you is, um, uh, what are the key driving forces shaping Russian attitudes towards this, this war in your analysis? Thank you. Sure. I think one of the points, and of course, we all know about, you know, the fear, the very real fear, but also the corrosive nature of fear and the fact that attitudes change when a person's, it's sort of, it's sociologically, a person's attitudes are unlikely to change dramatically and whilst their field of, of possible actions um, don't don't change. So there's there's that element. But I also think, and it does feel like it's perhaps been missing a bit from our discussion so far. Um, I think a big reason for for some of the for a lot of the approval is attitudes towards Ukraine, um, and specifically towards Ukraine and that sense of um, that you know there is a sense that Ukraine has betrayed Russia that Ukrainians really are Russians. And if they don't want to be, then, you know, I mean, some of these narratives around decommunization, Putin's, um, one of Putin's speeches on the eve of the invasion, oh, if you want decommunization, we'll show you what decommunization looks like. And then the bombing, you know, the bombing of all of the sort of infrastructure um, has been a big part of that campaign. And I think there's a particular attitude towards Ukraine um, within Russian um, society that, it's part of this, and I know I saw that somebody in the Q and A had asked about, you know, the role of public memory, and that's really important. I mean, that's why I started to do my PhD, is because I was so fascinated with the way that in 2014 the um, annexation of Crimea and the aggression in the Donbas was presented as Russians not just refighting World War II or the Great Patriotic War, as the Soviet war against Nazi Germany is referred to. Um, but also fighting for the memory of it, fighting so that they could defend the memory of World War II, which was being disgraced and destroyed and attacked by Ukrainian Nazi collaborators in in their in their sort of in the way that this was framed. And it was my my first case study in my PhD was to look at how this was done. And this narrative has continued. So we could. It's very easy to just look at these um, claims. Oh, okay, they say that Zelensky is a Nazi. That's insane. Nobody could believe that. Well. Nazi doesn't necessarily mean the same thing that perhaps I may, um, I would think that it means Nazi can often just mean somebody who is against the memory 
um, of the great victory of 1945 as won by the Soviet Union um, in, during the Great Patriotic War. And so it's become, there's an entire kind of different understanding of history or and even of historiography that, that one needs to understand on some why that works, of course, as well as the emotive role of the Great Patriotic War um, within Russian society. But the other aspect, I think, and maybe I don't, I imagine that possibly this won't be a very popular comment, but you know, there is a great deal of, of specifically Ukrainophobia that's existed. And also, I think, even not just within some of the pro-war groups, because certainly in my discussions, sometimes it's felt like Ukraine gets removed from, from the discussion of, of the war in a way that, you know, that, that really it can't be. And I don't think it comes from a place of inhumanity or, or even from a negative space. I mean, I'm just talking about my my own sort of personal friends here where I've tried to kind of where we've explored this sort of in conversations. But I think it comes from almost what the anthropologist or sociologist um, Jeremy Morris has called that sense of um, social racism, almost, you know, that Ukrainians, they're sort of country bumpkins, you know, this and, and this idea that actually, you know, now sort of they're Europeans and, and you know, welcomed, um, you know, in, in London and in Paris, whilst, um, you know, Russians increasingly, and I would say very unfairly when it comes to those liberal Russians who, well, not just liberal Russians, but those Russians who are against the war, and I'm very much against kind of individuals being singled out, I think it's, it's, it's most certainly not the way to do it. Obviously, they, they may feel like pariahs because of some of the countries in the West, their sort of visa and um, boycotting efforts and I think that's been quite difficult um, for, for some people to sort of manage. And it's, it's brought up some, some interesting feelings about sort of how Ukrainophobia exists within Russian thought and that it's perhaps not just something that exists, though it exists in its most heinous form um, among those who support the war. Yeah, some great points. And, and of course, we always have to pivot back to Ukraine since this war uh, you know, uh, is that's where it's fought out. And, and well, w what was striking from what you mentioned, you never mentioned the, the NATO expanding its borders uh, 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 argument, you know, that is often, uh, you know, thrown uh, in, 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 around in the Western press, but, um, but that, that there is also um, this aspect of, of Ukrainophobia in, inside uh, Russia that you that you talked about, and and of course public memory is is such a difficult issue to try and analyze. Also in in South Africa during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there was of course discussion about historical memory, which was defined as you know, there was a certain cutoff period, and the idea was, you know, that that it has to do with how the majority of people can remember a certain period of time. And so it dealt with that particular period. Um, but, but it's interesting how uh, some of the issues that you mentioned, even going back to World War II, is not people's direct memory of those events, but it's been reshaped in the public sphere um, over, over the last two decades, especially, and, and, and used uh, to serve specific purposes. But while we talk about these, these discourses, let's, let's go to Ian. Because uh, Ian, in your book, you also zoom in on, on uh, a, a range of symbols, including some "quote unquote" fascist symbols uh, displayed in, in, in wartime Russia. Talk to us about those symbols and, and the significance thereof. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, the, there are a range of symbols that we see. Everybody knows about the Z and V symbols nowadays, and the others that you might see are, of course, Soviet symbolism and paraphernalia, victory flags from World War II, and Jade's already very eloquently explained to us the importance of World War II to all of this. Although I, I would go even further and say that World War II really is a, a central underlying problem to why this does not end with Ukraine and this is not limited to Ukrainophobia. This is a much more expansive idea that suggests that Russia might always be under attack. Mojim Povdarit. We can do it again, but what is it, right? And when against whom? It's really never, never made clear who we're defending ourselves from, just this amorphous band of fascists and Nazis. But the others, the others that you might see, and this is this is where I think the symbols get interesting in the way that they're cut together, is, is czarist symbolism. And and people will often make the argument, well, Putin wants to wants to recreate the Soviet Union. 
Well, he doesn't because he is creating a discursive space in which symbolism that is mutually exclusive exists together. You cannot have a czarist flag next to a Soviet flag flying at a church. It just doesn't make sense. And it makes as little sense as the examples I, I pointed out about the, the language of Nazis and Jews and homosexuals earlier. But what this represents to me, especially because the majority of the symbolism is spread online and through social media, through VK groups and through Telegram, is that once again, social media is, and this, this touches on something Jade mentioned, social media always feels like it's very deeply rooted in the present, right? It feels like it's, it's the here and the now, but it's not. It is a fundamentally atemporal phenomenon that can bring together time periods, bring together the past, the present, and the future in a completely flexible way. You can inhabit in a moment that is beyond linear time, and I will stop getting into the philosophical explanation before I bore everybody to tears about the uh, academic details of it. But this is again a very powerful tool for the state because it can create a reality, a world, in which Russia exists beyond the boundaries of logic, in which Russia, despite losing the war, is winning the war, in which the glamour of the czarist era and the late 19th century flowering of literature and Tchaikovsky and ballet can all exist together. Russia is this great cultural state, and yet has the military might and nuclear might of the Soviet Union. And that allows people to read into the conflict almost anything they want. And I think this is, I speculate at least, that this is one of the reasons we see these sort of divergent groups being able to be comfortable with what's happening in the war. Because you can imagine that Russia is embarking on a civilizing mission in Ukraine. Russia is spreading the culture of the 19th century to Ukraine. Russia is losing, but simultaneously making itself militarily more powerful. And nothing says that better than the Z symbol, which seems to have been cooked up in a real hurry when they realized they weren't going to win the war real quick in a few days. And yet is ultimately completely meaningless. There is no history behind it, no tradition behind it. It is completely plastic in its meaning. And it can either become the symbol of Russian greatness, Russian power, a return to the Soviet Union, or it can be for the opposition, Zachim. Why? What are we doing all of this for? Yeah, and thank you again. Uh, great points there also. And, and of course, we have to look at the power of the symbolism involved uh, in, in, in shaping attitudes also. Um, Maxim, let's turn to you. Uh, simple question for you, but, but uh, or, or a short, I have a short question for you, but it, it is a very complicated one too. How do you think this war will end and and where does your party stand on on crimea thank you uh well i think that the war will end by negotiations any wars end by negotiations sooner or later but the problem today is that each side of this war thinks that they can win on the battlefield uh also russia and also the ukraine uh, that is why there is no negotiations right now and people are continuing to die on the battlefields. And um, these negotiations will start anyway. But to that point, to uh, I assume that hundreds, uh, thousands of people will, will die. So uh, we in Yabloko Party consider that it is absolutely necessary and urgent even today to make an uh, ceasefire agreement uh, to stop the fire and then there could be negotiations so they could be successful or not so successful but without uh, this point of uh, stopping the fire there could be no negotiations and this is only first and necessary step so uh, this is a political demand which has the goal of saving lives. And this is what is the most important today, we think. Uh, the ceasefire agreement is 
uh, only the preliminary step, the very first step to the start uh, to reach uh, a settlement. And about uh, this uh, very complicated case with the Crimea, uh, we consider that in future, in further future, it is important that it has to be a new referendum uh, steering international organizations mm -hmm. and uh, the rules of such a one more referendum should be discussed at the special international conference about the Crimea. But uh, this uh, case is uh, will be in future, in very far the future. And uh, it's clear that today we can't speak about any of this. So this is uh, an instrument how we can deal this uh, in future, but of course not today. Thank you. I just Thank want you, to, make, to, say, to say this to make sure we have time, but Maxim, if you want to save lives, and I know you're in a difficult position legally, but if you want to save lives, then the answer is very clear, and that is Russia. Russia goes home, leave Ukraine, leave Crimea, and that is that is the only way out of this, and that is morally and legally the way out of this. Yes, you know, Ian, I agree with you. This would be the perfect, the perfect decision. Uh, but we are realistic. Yes, we have to provide some realistic plan. Of course, uh, it would be great that you know, to uh, Russian forces to go home, to go to the border of uh, the end of the February last year, it would be great. But to be realistic, it is impossible right now. And we provide, I think, the more realistic plan to uh, the first step of ending this. Yes, the fire has been stopped. And then we uh, have to wait for some negotiations because in other case, people will continue to die and uh, this is a great amount of people who will die. And I think that uh, this is more realistic plan. And what you have said, yes, it would be very great, but it is impossible right now, unfortunately. May, may I come in um, and yes, please. no way wanting to feel like we're all jumping on poor Maxim, um, who, who yeah. is incredibly brave. But I just wonder about, I, I definitely take your point about being about being realistic, but I also think that if we are we not forgetting a bit here about Ukrainian agency because it's not realistic to impose a ceasefire on the Ukrainians, they will not take it. I don't think Zelensky is politically suicidal enough to try to impose it, but also the Ukrainians, they just wouldn't accept it. it so I, I don't think, and of course, I think as well, it might be seen as bad to call for a ceasefire, particularly right now before the counteroffensive. I agree with you that lives are the most important element and that um, it may not be realistic to be able to get Crimea back right now and, and elements like this. And of course, you know, I don't see how there can be any kind of military assault on Crimea. That, that doesn't seem like a good idea to bit mildly, but, at the same point, there is no way that that a ceasefire that the Ukrainians would accept a ceasefire, let alone even getting to the point that there's absolutely zero evidence that um, you know they, the Russian side wouldn't just use that to sort of rearm um, and that they would in any way respect the ceasefire. We've seen no evidence of that. So I just wanted to query the use of realistic. All right, thanks for those points. Let's quickly um, let's kind of like stay on this issue of. Russia-Ukraine relations and, and, and what that would ultimately mean. I'm going to ask Alina, um, and, and I want to ask all the panelists just to be super short in their responses. I know some of you have to uh, jump on a, another call. I know, Ian, you have to go. I'm not sure about you, Jay, but I'll check with you in the chat. But, um, but so just be very brief in terms of your sport response. But Alina, um, talk to us about the general breakdown of Russia-Ukraine relations at the societal level. And and what should be done to reconcile relations between Russia and, and, and Ukraine? Thank you, Aline. And thanks again for that question. But may I comment on uh, Maxim's issues too? Very brief. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a huge question. So with whom to negotiate? So if you want to negotiate with someone, uh, you want that person to be responsible for his own actions. And it's not about our current president. So I, I need to highlight that he's not my president, but the president of, of the country, uh, of my country. So um, I truly understand why 
there is no any negotiations now. And yes, I, I totally agree uh, that um, Zelensky is not about his political suicide. So he will not be supported by the people in Ukraine because they, they will ask him, so what for all our people died? So why, why do you start that negotiation with that person who has his warrant order from the International Criminal, uh, criminal Court? So the main idea is, okay, so who was, who will be the person to negotiate with? And this is a question to us, to our population, to ourselves, Russians. Russians, I mean, um, that Russians or that strata of uh, Emana or within our society who would like to take that responsibility. And uh, so I, I, I feel sorry for what's going on because I have my relatives. I have my friends in Ukraine. And, um, you know, I told you earlier that we, uh, from the beginning of the war and the second day, we started our hotline to help all the people who face um this crazy issues uh, like what's going on what can i do can i do anything can i influence so please help me it was a psychological line and we have more than seventy thousand people who called us in two weeks it, it was really huge amount of people and some of them they ask us do you think if i can commit a suicide and i'm not kidding because it was a huge question so if i can't influence anything why do I leave? What for? What is the aim of my life? And can I stop it if I have my relatives in Ukraine? Afterwards, I, I had a call from my friend. Uh, she's Ukrainian and she was in Kiev when the war was started. And she has her son, six years old son. Uh, she's a politician, a Ukrainian politician. And she said, look, um, I'm going to leave Ukraine, but the road is bombing and my son is crying and he's yelling. So you know, I, I can't handle it. Please do something. Can you do something, Alina? And, and we decided with her and with some uh, great ladies from Belarus uh, to organize the community women to women. We tried to build that bridges uh, within our societies. We try to explain each other. Okay, so, and, and as you understand, so the, the, the ladies from Belarus and ladies from Ukraine, mostly they asked me, so do you feel that you are responsible? Do you feel your guilt? Uh, can you really do something, Alina? And I, I, you know, again, I don't have my magic bullet, but we have our 10 suggestions, 10, you know, points what to do in terms of like career, rebuild or at least trying to rebuild uh, the relationships uh, between Russian society and Ukrainian society. It's not about countries, it's about society, about people within the society, especially women. And also uh, my last point is that um, it is very hard. It is very hard because I personally feel guilt, but I'm against this collective guilt because collective guilt means that you are not self-responsible for what's going on. I think that self-responsibility is a key point. So if you want to be self-responsible, I want to be self-responsible. So I have my Russian passport again. I don't want to get rid of my Russian passport because I am responsible for that. Um, but I, I want to use as this model name, Nansen Dialogue. You know, it was used in, um, in Albania and Serbia. So at least we need to, to, to start to just hear our traumas. Uh, we need to speak it. We need to name it. And then maybe just like among this uh, women community, women to women. Maybe that's- Thank you, Alina. Uh, thank you. And, and those are really good points also on, on how this uh, conflict, of course, shapes uh, you know, people to people relations, which is something we need to talk about more. Jade, I know you got to go, but um, I've got a very quick question for you related to, uh, you know, this issue that you, that you mentioned on on how memory shapes discourses in, in, in Russia. What do you think would happen should Putin is ousted or if Ukraine wins this war? How would that impact uh, uh, relations between Russians and Ukrainians and, and this issue of, of public discourse? I mean, that's a huge question. Um, I just want to very quickly say how much um, I agreed with what um, Alina just said. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, it's wonderful. And, and a lot of this needs to be done on the personal level. And I think remembering the individuals, remembering sort of, you know, that there are human beings suffering. I think all of these elements, they're important because often this discussion is so abstracted um, in terms of geopolitics and we forget just how many, you know, 
how many tragedies are just going on because of this this awful war. Um, so in terms of the collective memory discourse, if Putin goes, look, like I said at the start, really, Putin is a major catalyst for this war. I do, I, do, I, you know, the war was already continuing, but for it to be the way that it's being fought now, quite clearly, that was not a, a decision that was taken on on a democratic level. That was clearly a decision within, you know, a small group of of, 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 of men. Um, I don't think that the war would continue on this level, um, but I think in some ways many of the feelings and the emotions and that sense of humiliation and, 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 and depredation and injured pride that the propaganda has built on, they would be there, but even worse now, because you're going to have so many men traumatized by the war, you're going to have so many families destroyed by the war, um, and of course as well economically things are even more difficult, so you're going to have even more of these feelings and it's it's very worrying to look around because obviously they've done such a terrible job of well they've done such a good job rather of but a ter morally terrible of destroying um so much of the democratic opposition um and then you know some of the opposition that remains is 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 is, is frankly you know just as sometimes more terrifying than, than than Putin um so that's why it is important that support is given to the Russian opposition um and you know to ensure that that other Russia you know a different Russia different sort of narratives exist um and you know the work of Medusa and the engagement that Medusa has is for example just to pick one is is really incredible um as a final point I would just like to quickly come back because I know there's been a couple of questions in the chat before I go to towards the issue of ceasefire and the idea that that is is peace, and I think that of course nobody wants Ukrainians to die, but I, I nobody wants to be honest with you. I don't want Russian soldiers to die, of course, either. You know, I, it's it's obviously a nightmare, the whole thing. But the issue is that if there is a ceasefire, it wouldn't be respected. We aren't dealing with a good faith person. I feel like one thing that all of the panelists agree on is that Putin is not a good faith person who you can negotiate with. He's clearly not somebody who wants to make peace. And I think we need to deal with that fact that, that there is no way, there is no way of having this proper ceasefire at, at the moment. Um, that's not to say there isn't a place for negotiations. There is, I just don't think it can be negotiations around the ceasefire right now. And we know negotiations are going on around the grain deal, around the return of children from her son. So, and I think it's good, it's good to have those discussions, of course, but there needs to be some, I think we need to be realistic. Who, when we say we want peace, who do we want peace for, for us? So we don't have to see all of the misery on the TV or for actually for Ukrainians who, who are going through this. Um, but on that, I have to I have to leave. But thank you for a really fascinating panel and, and thank you to all the panelists for some really wonderful thoughts and, and, and discussions. And thank you, of course, Leon um, and Julia for organizing. Of course, thanks, Jay. Thanks, thanks for joining us and we'll talk to you soon. Um, yeah, and I'd, I'd hate to let you go before uh, asking you a question about the, the youth army, which you've focused on quite a bit um, over, over the past few months. Uh, the, the Kremlin, of course, is, is turbocharging indoctrination through a variety of efforts that are uh, aimed at its youth. And, and, and recently you singled out the, the youth army um, as an important instrument thereof. Would you, would you care to just elaborate on that? Um, briefly. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, sure. So I'll give you a very brief history of the youth army. So this was founded in early 2016. It was supposedly the brainchild of the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, but came from came from somewhere within the Kremlin. I'm not quite sure I buy that it's his idea. And the, the Kremlin threw a lot of money behind it. Membership grew pretty rapidly for the first two or three years. And the group was intended to be basically Cub Scouts with guns. And they laid out their goals on their website. You, anyone can go look at their website. Um, and the goals are to prepare children morally, spiritually, and physically for war. With the explicit intention of getting children, or at least getting boys, because Russia is becoming an increasingly gendered society, getting boys ready to join the armed forces, and getting girls ready to fulfill traditional gender roles and work in civilian helper roles behind the lines. And so these kids go off and they do they do activities in school gyms, doing firearms training, physical training. They write letters to the troops, lots of sort of sports competitions. So there's sort of Soviet element to some of the work. But there is a real military element to it as well, more than what you would see in, in a sort of cadet force in North America that, you know, I can go down the street and see that Canadians are doing where I live. Um, 
But where this group has really taken off in the last two or three years is in digitization. A couple of years ago, Nikita Nagorny, who is a who is an Olympic medal winning gymnast and huge social media influence, he has hundreds of thousands of followers, was appointed leader of the group. Of course, he's just a figurehead. He's, he's 25, 26 years old, very photogenic, handsome, sort of rippling physique. And he spreads the message of Youth Army on his channels, along with workout videos, photos of his sort of, you know, ideal dream influence lifestyle. And increasingly, they've kind of gamified the movement. They've made a fun app that you can download if you want to join. I joined the Youth Army. It was really easy. I just had to download it on a burner phone, set my location to, to Russia, and, you know, fill out the form. Within a couple of days, I got the answer back. You're in. So Ivan Ivanov from Belgorod Oblast is uh, in the uh, Youth Army. He's never been to any events. And you can play games, win prizes, earn points. They do TikTok videos, TikTok campaigns that make it look fun to be in this organization. So it's not this sort of recreation of Soviet era stuff. And look, for my, for my book, and the, and the book is all about people. It's all about stories and characters. I talked to the father of a 14-year-old girl from the provinces, Masha. And he's a sort of, you know, in Jade's apathetic group. He's, he's not that bothered about politics. He just wants to forget all about it, really. But it was Masha that came to him and said, my friends are in the youth army. I've seen them on social media. Can I join? He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. And they signed up. They ordered the kit on Wildberries, which is like, I don't know, like Amazon or something like that, big e-commerce site, really easy. It arrives. And now she posts these sort of TikTok feed videos about her life in the youth army that just intermingle with her life as an ordinary teenager. And it's full of normal sort of everyday internet talk, hashtag fulfill yourself, hashtag dreams come true, all that kind of, you know, sort of stuff. But often she'll just pop up talking about ordinary stuff while wearing her youth army t-shirt. She's becoming this. And increasingly she's sharing more violent content. And expressing admiration for, for example, she posted a video a few months ago of police beating protesters in Moscow or Petersburg, I don't remember, and said something like, you know, go, go at it, guys, or when I grow up, I want to be like you, something like that. That is the way this group works. It is insidious. It creeps its way into day-to-day -day life. And if the state can make it a success, that is the way they're going to transform children's minds. That is going to be very hard to break this generation out of, but it is a big if, as I said right at the very beginning. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so essentially, the Kremlin is using uh, different strokes for different folks uh, in order to 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 uh, target their audience. Um, uh, I'm I don't want to abuse our time, and I, I know that there are so many questions from our audience members, which means I think we'll have to like invite all of you back again for some more questions to just focus on the audience. But I'm going to ask uh, Maxim to, to close us off. And I'm going to ask you a two-legged question to try and encompass some of the audience members' questions uh, with, with uh, uh, you know, just to try and bring a number of things together. But um, um, how is this war, Maxim, affecting domestic politics in Russia? Do you think the Russian regime is becoming more and more totalitarian. We all, of course, know that that, that term has a very specific meaning. And, 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 and then I'd like to ask you a more kind of policy-oriented uh, question. What's your advice to policymakers outside Russia regarding the future of Russia-Ukraine relations and Russia's relations with the EU, UK, and US? Thank you, Maxim. Uh, yes, thanks a lot for these questions, especially the last. I think that it is a very important one. So uh, about the internal politics, I think that when Putin started this military actions against the Ukraine, among the other reasons, uh, the big reason was the question about his power, about his authority. And uh, uh, by this war, uh, he closed all these questions. So the majority of those who are active disagree with him, 
they left the country. Some of them are in prison. I can tell that, uh, unfortunately, lots of my friends and some of my colleagues are in prison. Others are afraid. And uh, Alona told us about all these risks uh, and cases about uh, censorships, about no freedom of speech, no freedom of protest assemblies and uh, other stuffs. So uh, there is no legal uh, opportunity to protest against the war, against uh, Putin and against his uh, party. So the question about his power is closed. I think that he will be the next uh, president and there will be no problems for him uh, in any way of um, how uh, uh, the battlefield in the Ukraine uh, will end. So if he wins this war, it will be okay for him. Or if he lose some territory in the Ukraine, it will be also okay for him because he can tell uh, the audience inside the Russia that the whole world is against us and we have stand uh, together and uh, uh, together across uh, of me my uh, or across my part and uh, we shall struggle against this. So uh, I think that uh, I will go to your next question. I think that it is very important. I think that it is extremely important to stop this process of canceling Russians and all Russia. Uh, I think that when uh, some of West countries stopped uh, providing visas to Russian, to Russians close uh, their borders, uh, and uh, such actions they close the world to Russians close. Uh, the possibility, uh, the possibility to see the alternative, close the possibility for Russians to see the lie of Russian propaganda, and as a result, uh, uh, the majority of Russians think that the whole world is against them, and as a result, even those who are against the war, they think that they are the enemy of the Western world and that they have no future in this world and that they have no other option than to win in this war because otherwise they have no future and have no alternative. And I think that the West countries have to show Russians that it is, is not so, that Russians are not the enemies and that they are not isolated of the world as Putin wanted to be, and that they, Russians, have some future after the end of this war. And speaking about isolations, I want to give some a little bit funny, but an absurd example of this. Uh, you know that at the beginning of the war, Netflix, the company, yes, left Russia and prohibited to watch its films in Russia. So Netflix uh, stopped taking money from the Russian economy and this money stays inside Russia for the military action. But this is not the case. Uh, recently, Netflix made a film, uh, anti-military film uh, on the great book of Eric Maria Remark, uh, A Quiet on the Western Front. Yes, the title. Uh, so I thought that it would be extremely useful for Russians to see this film because this film is against the war, it is anti-military, but no, it is impossible to do it in Russia. And not because Putin prohibited it, but because Netflix prohibited this. No way for Russians to watch the film which is against the war. I think this is a little bit absurd. And uh, I think it has to be much more clever politics for Russia. And um, if we are speaking about uh, the future, about the future, uh, we in the Yabloka party think that the only European future is possible 
for Russia, Ukraine, and for Belarus, like European Union. Uh, you know, uh, some years ago, it was told that the main reason for the European Union, uh, the reason for such constructions, uh, to deal such construction was to avoid the war in Europe because there are no borders and there are no meanings for the war. Uh, no war between France and Germany for Alsace and Lotharingia because there is no reasons for, for it, there is no borders. So I think that this is the only way for uh, our countries in future. I think that such uh, plans need to be for uh, Russians in future. And I think that West countries have to suggest, suggest these plans for Russian society. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Maxim. And, and, and also uh, noted on the, uh, uh, the point that you make that, that in the Western world, we have to be much smarter about our messaging. And, and perhaps the key point there is to, to map out uh, a future beyond this, perhaps uh, how we define Russia in a, in a, in a post-Putin situation. We need to start signaling uh, how we see that, how we envision that, and how we can support that also. Um, thank you to all four of our panelists, uh, Alina, Jade, Ian, Maxim. Um, I really appreciate your time. I, I do apologize also to our audience and to you that we went over by a bit, but, um, but this was a really fascinating discussion to our audience. Uh, thank you for joining us. And, and please join us again in a few weeks uh, for another Russia-Ukraine dialogue. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.